So I'm going to talk about one of the key tools that I use in my work, which is array seismology. And I'll focus on how we can use seismic arrays as part of our project to image the outermost core using SMKS waves. I'll begin with a very basic example. Suppose we only had one ear and we hear a sound coming from a source. It could be coming from this source or this source. And with a single ear or receiver, we wouldn't easily be able to distinguish the location of the source. However, with two receivers, we could measure the differential time of the, the sound arriving at our two ears and identify that the source of the sound is on our right. The aim of our collaborative project is to determine the structure of the outermost outer core using the group of seismic waves known as SMKS. In particular, we'll look at the differences in travel time between pairs of these waves, such as S4KS and S3KS. These waves tr travel through the outer core, um, but also through the mantle. The outermost outer core is suspected to contain unmodeled radial velocity structure, while the lowermost mantle is known to contain localized variations in seismic velocities. Both of these would affect the travel times of SMKS waves, but 3D velocity anomalies in the mantle would also refract waves, bending them off of the predicted path. And with an array, we'd be able to see this. We could de detect this change in direction. With seismic arrays, we can determine if travel time anomalies are the result of velocity anomalies in the outermost core or in the lower mantle. In this talk, I'll begin by introducing arrays. Basically, what is an array? What seismic arrays do we have and why do we use them? Secondly, the theory of how we use arrays, how an array sees the seismic wave field and how we can use an array to extract information about it. Thirdly, I'll talk about some other methodologies that I use to improve standard methods. And then I'll talk about what we have to consider when we design an array. Finally, I'll talk about how we're applying these to study the outer core and lowermost mantle using SMKS. Firstly, what is an array? Put generally, an array is a collection of three or more sensors of the same type that are used together. In this talk, I'll focus on seismic arrays, which comprise multiple seismometers. For instance, Yellowknife Array in uh, Northern Canada has 18 independent seismometers that can be used together but other kinds of arrays also exist and are used in analogous ways to seismic arrays, such as radio telescope arrays comprising multiple radio telescopes. This is the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array in Socorro, New Mexico, which consists of 27 independent antenna. In medical science, electroencephalograms use multiple electrodes to monitor excitation of brain neurons as a function of location and time. And this cap contains 100 electrodes. Overall, arrays have two main advantages over single stations. Firstly, the improved signal to noise ratio by combining multiple observations. And then secondly, as I discussed at the start, the ability to resolve the direction of a signal by looking at the differences between multiple observations. Focusing on seismic arrays, they come in many different forms, and I'm showing a limited set of examples here. Throughout the talk, I'll use this inverted triangle symbol to signify a seismometer. Seismic arrays, like much of seismology, stem from nuclear testing. The first seismic arrays were built following the atmospheric nuclear test ban in 1958, and they were designed to detect underground nuclear tests by amplifying and accurately locating the high frequency P waves from underground nuclear bombs. These first arrays were mini arrays that were just a couple of kilometers across, similar to this more modern mini array. Later arrays were designed with the same goal of detecting underground nuclear tests, but they were a little bit larger and tuned towards one hertz P waves. 
The UK Atomic Energy Administration built several arrays such as Yellowknife in North Northern Canada. And this is one of my favorites to work with. Later arrays, so this, uh, Sonseca is an example of a multi-scale array with a dense core of short period stations surrounded by a sparse network of broadband stations. And more recently, we've had development of country and continent scale arrays, such as HiNet, Alparay, Catval array, and then the lower 48 and Alaska components of the US array. And these two we use as part of this project. These arrays have very different scales and geometries owing to the different goals. And later I'll talk about how we decide what size and shape of an array we need, depending on our scientific question. I'll no now go through how we use an array to achieve both clearer signals and extract the directiv div directivity information from seismic waves. To understand how this works, we need to consider how waves are seen by seismic arrays. And let's start with an important assumption in array processing that the incoming wave is a plane wave. This assumption is valid for relatively large uh, um, source receiver distances and relatively small station spacings. Now let's imagine there's an earthquake a long distance away and the plane wave arrives at our array. As a plane wave front moves across an array, the delay time of the wave at each station is characteristic of the incoming direction of the wave and the position of the station. This delay time is known as the move out and uh, describes the time delay as a function of distance across the array. A wave coming from a different direction would have a different move out. Thus, we can use the move out to determine the incoming direction of the wave. And this direction is defined both in terms of direction on the surface or back azimuth, which we measure relative to north, and also slowness, which is related to the instance angle and the apparent seismic velocity across the array. The slowness is measured in seconds per degree, so how many seconds in time it takes a wave to travel a degree in horizontal distance. Zero slowness means that the ray is vertical, it arrives everywhere at the same time, and a high slowness means that the ray is more horizontal. The slowness and back azimuth can be expressed as the slowness vector, u. And this comprises the two horizontal components, ux and uy, and the vertical component, uz. The two horizontal components of the slowness vector, ux and uy, are in the east-west and north-south directions, respectively. The horizontal components comprise the horizontal slowness vector, which is equivalent to the ray parameter, and which is and this is characteristic of the particular seismic wave. Using a 1D radial velocity model of the Earth, we can predict the slowness of any given seismic wave, and so we can use slowness as a diagnostic tool to identify waves. So now that we can describe how an array sees a seismic wave, wave, let's use this understanding to learn about the seismic wave field. I'm going to talk about how we use arrays using a real world example from our project of observing SMKS waves at the US array. And in this project, we use sub arrays of the whole US array so that we can see how slowness and back azimuth of these waves vary across the country. So here is a sub array where we've taken 13 nearby stations from the US array, in this case, at the Alabama-Georgia border, and formed them into a new sub-array. All of these stations recorded the, uh, the SKKS wave from an earthquake in Indonesia. Get used to this array because we're going to be using it for the rest of the talk. The red triangles mark the location of the station, and the yellow triangle marks the array center here defined as the arithmetic average location of all of the, the individual stations. The yellow line marks the great circle path back to the uh, source, so the shortest distance between the source and the receiver, 
and the gray lines show the wavefront propagating out from the, from the source. And then here are the observed radial um, component seismograms sorted by increasing source receiver distance. We're going to use these multiple records to construct a representation of the wave field or ground motion at the array central location. And the array will record the time dependent signal F and the noise N. Each seismometer I in the array has position RI relative to the central location. And each seismometer will record um, some the, uh, the, the signal F and some local station dependent noise, NI. But the signal will have a time shift related uh, relative to the center, depending on the location of the station, RI, and the slowness vector. This, uh, this time shift is what gives us the move out of the signal across the array. If we choose the horizontal slowness, then we can correct for this time shift. So we can predict the time shift and we can add it back in. And, um, and this depends on the uh, slowness that we choose. So each station now shows the, and then we can align each station. So each station uh, now has the signal aligned and some noise that is now time shifted, but we can see that the signals are aligned. Now that we're there, they're aligned, we can sum the traces, which is also known as stacking. It's also called beam forming since we form the beam, B. And it's also known as delay and sum since we have removed the delays and then we sum the traces. And we add up the information in the different traces and then we average this over the number of stations in the array, N. And we average over the signal, uh, which is the same everywhere. So we get F back but we also sum an average over the time shifted station dependent noise. So here we introduce two more important assumptions. The signal is coherent everywhere between the stations. So, uh, which means it's, the signal is roughly the same phase at each station and therefore it will sum constructively. And the second is that the noise is local and thus uncorrelated between the stations in the array. Meaning that when we sum or stack, the noise will destructively interfere and cancel. Assuming the signal to be coherent, when we sum, we, re we recover the original signal. And assuming the noise to be uncorrelated, when we sum, we suppress the noise and average it by the number of stations in the beam. And then we form our beam. This, uh, we can see that it uh, dramatically increases the amplitude of the signal relative to the amplitude of the noise. And so this is increasing our signal to noise ratio, which we define as the um, ratio uh, of the amplitude, maximum amplitude of the signal to the uh, average uh, absolute amplitude of the noise. The signal to noise of the traces used to form the beam is 1.4. But now the signal to noise of our beam is closer to seven. So we get a drastic increase. And this increase in signal to noise um, primarily depends on the number of traces that we use. So the improvement is approximately equal to the square root of the number of stations, the number of stations used to form the beam. This expression assumes perfectly coherent signals and uncorrelated noise. But we can demonstrate this effect with an example. As with the, um, as we did, did with the data before, we're going to stack the traces. I'm going to form beams using an increasing number of stations. And you'll see how the signal to noise evolves as we increase the number of stations and how the beam also evolves. So as we increase the number of stations, the signal to noise significantly increases and the waveform evolves. Now we have a very sharply defined SKKS wave, despite how no noisy the input data are. And this highlights the value of the array techniques. Sometimes we can make something out of nothing.
And this is really important because we can apply this in global seismology to lower the detection threshold for seismic waves, allowing us to use data that we previously discarded because it was considered too noisy. So that's the basics. We remove the move out of, uh, of a wavefront across the array based on some slowness, and then we sum it up. Now I'm going to discuss some modifications to the beamforming method so that we, can, that we can use to help learn more about the Earth. When we form the beam using the correct delay time, the amplitude of the signal increases. And so it follows that the greatest amplitude of the signal will be when we use the correct delay time, i.e. the correct slowness vector. If we don't know the slowness that a phase arrives from, we can search over a range of slownesses while holding the back azimuth constant. Assume, uh, we can assume that to be the great circle path. And then we calculate the beam and select the slowness that maximizes the beam amplitude. And th this is known as forming a Vespergram or slant stacking. In the Vespergram, we show beam amplitude as a function of time and slowness. I formed a Vespergram here between slownesses of zero and 10 seconds per degree. Um, and this is assuming the great circle path back azimuth. And so this is effectively a series of beams constructed on different slownesses colored by amplitude. We can see the maximum amplitude here marked by the green star. And notice that the slowness of the maximum amplitude is greater than that of the purple point, which is the prediction from the 1D reference model. So this is telling us about the Earth. We have a slightly less steep uh, wave than is predicted, which is possible because of some velocity structure along the path. Another interesting feature here is not the signal, but the noise. Notice this uh, blue-red checkerboard pattern. It has a Period, uh, periodicity of about 10 seconds, which is that of our uh, input records. And so this is aliasing. This is where some of the uh, waves uh, sum constructively um, and, uh, and form local maxima and minima. Remember this pattern because we'll talk about it again later. And we can also form um, back azimuth vespergrams here holding the slowness constant. Again, notice that the, uh, for this example, the SKKS wave arrives off of the predicted path, off of the great circle path, suggesting some velocity heterogeneity. And we can also perform a grid search simultaneously of a slowness and back azimuth, which we refer to as a beam pack. Forming Vesp Vespergrams is a really important tool since we can, use, we can measure the true slowness and back azimuth information of a wave. And we can observe how this, uh, this deviates from 1D predictions, and we can, which suggests 3D structure. And we can also identify the source of energy, which is really helpful if we don't know what we're looking at in the case of uh, scattered waves or reflections. So while Vespergrams are great, we're going to use some extra tricks to increase their efficacy. And there are lots of methods, but here I'm going to focus on the F statistic, which isn't the same as the statistical concept of the F statistic. The F statistic in seismology is the ratio of the energy in the beam to the difference between um, the beam and each station used to form it. And this is done in some time window and then we move this time window through our traces to form the F trace. So this ratio penalizes any beams that don't look like the beam. They sort of look like the traces used to form them. And so it sharpens up the slowness and back azimuth resolution of our process. So for example, here is um, slowness and back azimuth resolution for a PKP wave recorded at yellow and F array using the standard beam forming process. Slowness is on the radial axis, and back azimuth is on the azimuthal axis. Using the, from this, we would conclude that the signal arrives with a slowness of about 1.5 to 3 seconds per degree, and between about 10 and 60, 60 degrees back azimuth. 
However, processing the same data with the F statistic, we dramatically increase the precision of, of our measurement. So now we'd conclude the slowness is about 2.1 seconds per degree, and it arrives at a back azimuth of 40 degrees. So just with this uh, small modification to the process, we dramatically increase the resolution. And this is especially effective for noisy signals. Look at how sharply the SKKS wave stands out in the beam relative to the noise and also in the F trace. An important point about the F trace is that what we're left with is just a ratio. Therefore, it no longer contains the waveform information nor the amplitude. So while the F trace very precisely resolves slowness and back azimuth, um, we have to use it in conjunction with the beam if we want, want to look at waveforms and amplitudes. So here's the uh, same SKKS data, now processed using the F trace. Again, we're calculating F amplitude for a range of slowness and back azimuths, making this an F pack. So we have the slowness vespigram and the back azimuth vespigram. Much of the noise and aliasing that we saw before has now been suppressed. Um, we just see strong positive signals around our arrivals. So from this, we can really precisely resolve deviations of slowness and back azimuth from the, um, from the predictions. And we can relate this to earth, earth properties. So we've discussed how we use arrays. Now I'll discuss how we design arrays and tailor them to answer specific questions. The design of, a, of an array is crucial to the slowness, back azimuth, and frequency resolution. And the sensitivity to these parameters is described by the array response function or array transfer function. And this sensitivity is all about the ability to detect the difference in arrival time of a wave between the different stations in the array, and also not confusing different peaks of the same wave. Here are the basic rules illustrated with the ideal case where we can uniquely pick out the move out of a signal of interest shown by the red lines and uh, the red line and the red circles. So the first point is the aperture. This is the maximum width of the array. Since beamforming relies on the ability to detect the difference in arrival time, the width of our array controls what slownesses and also what frequencies the array can resolve. For example, this small array, just these three stations here, for this steeply arriving wave, the difference in travel time between these three stations would be very small. So we need to very precisely resolve the travel time to be able to accurately determine the slowness. However, if we had a larger aperture shown by these gray stations, the differences in arrival time would be larger, so it'd be easier to resolve this. This is also true for frequency. If we were to look at a lower, a lower frequency wave, the difference between the waveform at the different stations would be small unless we had a very large array. So the rough rule of thumb is that you want your maximum wavelength to be about the aperture of your array. Otherwise, your whole array would record the wave looking the same with no time delays, and it would act like a single station. The other aperture consideration is that of coherence, although I don't have a, a figure for this one. The wave must be coherent across the array for it to sum constructively. High frequency waves will travel through more cycles as they propagate across the array, and so they're more likely to become incoherent. So we have to tune the array size to the signal frequency that we're interested in. The next is the number of stations. This controls the resolution and the ability to avoid aliasing, so distinguishing between different directions. With fewer stations, like in this example, we don't have many data points to confirm that this is actually the correct direction. The next is spacing. This controls the minimum frequency that an array could resolve, and also the precision of that frequency. More stations closely together allow you to better distinguish time differences, and thus increases the sensitivity to high frequency waves. 
And then lastly, we have the geometry. This controls back, az back azimuth sensitivity. So consider an array where most of the stations are um, at the same back azimuth. We'd be able to resolve some back azimuths, but uh, there would be a large uncertainty in certain back azimuths. So we need to bear all this mind in, in mind when we design our array. So let's look at a graphical representation of the array response function. And these show sensitivity to a signal from a given direction. And the ideal array response function is that of a 2D delta spike at the real direction, which means the only constructively stacking direction is the real one. No other directions be, can be confused. So this figure shows um, the sensitivity of the array to a one hertz P wave arriving with zero slowness. The correct slowness is shown by this green circle. Again, slowness is on the radial direction and back azimuth is on, is on the azimuthal direction. Notice how this cross-shaped array has amplitude, therefore some degree of coherent stacking along, the, along a range of slownesses that are uh, the same back azimuth as the arms of the array. So these side lobes are the result of aliasing. Meanwhile, the circular array doesn't have uh, side lobes. However, because it's smaller aperture, it's not very sensitive to slownesses at this frequency. And so many different slownesses and back azimuths have similarly high stacking amplitudes. In contrast, this is a much larger array and therefore it's more, um, and more precise. But notice how it's elongate and our array response function is also elongate along uh, um, parallel to the short direction of the array. So there would be more aliasing of uh, directions uh, we would not as precisely resolve direction along uh, um, parallel to the short direction of the array. So this brings us to designing our subarrays at the UX array. Unlike most work using permanent arrays where the geometry is already set, with this project, we can, const uh, we can construct whatever subarray of the UX array we want. I tested the best geometry for resolving SMKS waves and the target phase also sets the target uh, slowness and period since SMKS has a um, range of slownesses and a range of a uh, dominant period of 10 seconds. And these influence the best array geometry. So using a fixed number of stations, I tested the ability of four different array geometries to accurately resolve um, signals of this frequency and slowness from a range of different back azimuths. So here is the average uh, F amplitude and the one standard deviation error bar showing the range of um, uh, range of uh, f amplitudes for the different directions that the wave might be coming from. So while the square array has the uh, highest average amplitude, we end up choosing the diamond shape array because it has less uh, variation with back azimuth. So it's, um, there's less, um, it has greater, greater sensitivity to all back azimuths. Um, and so when we construct our subarrays at the US array, we aim to match this diamond shape wherever possible. Although, because we're, we're working with a real array with real stations, that isn't always possible. And so here is the array response function for our US array subarray. This is constructed for the 10 seconds dominant period of SMKS waves and see how sharp this is. Um, and there is some asymmetry due to this, uh, this shape of our array, but generally we were able to get very, hot, uh, very accurate resolution of slowness and back azimuth for this given array geometry. Now that we've uh, discussed how we use arrays and how we design them, I'll briefly touch on what we've done so far. So this brings us back to how velocity anomalies in the mantle can refract SMKS waves. And we've seen that how, um, how we could record the resulting slowness and back azimuth anomalies using the US array. 
and we can repeat this subarray process across the US array using different earthquakes. So far, we've measured residual travel times for 12 earthquakes, here plotted uh, for SKKS at the subarray locations. And the symbol color shows systematic variation of travel times that likely result from mantle and crustal structure. But we can also measure variations of slowness and back azimuth. And this gives us more detail about velocity anomalies in the Earth. With these subarrays, we can now see how SMKS waves are refracted, and we can attribute this to velocity anomalies in the mantle. And taking advantage of the signal to noise improvement from array processing, we'll be able to study outer core, the outer core with even more wave types of SMKS that have not been used before. For example, we can use noisy arrays and short distance SKS waves, and even major arc waves that are usually considered too attenuated to be able to look at. What's more, we can also make beams using the transverse uh, component as well as the radial component. What remains now is our work with Maureen to use these radial and transverse data to understand the effects of low mantle anisotropy on these waves, and our work with Ibru to forward model the effects of low mantle heterogeneity, which we can compare with our subarray measurements. Thanks to array seismology, we'll be able to use more high quality data and the additional diagnostic measures of slowness and back azimuth to extract the signal of mantle heterogeneity and better understand the outer core. And with that, I will wrap up. Using arrays enhances weak signals and allows more information to be extracted from the seismic wave field. Array methods are flexible and they can be adjusted so that they can be applied to many different scales of seismic array. And we can use the F trace or other methods to improve the precision of our measurements. And we can use array methods in conjunction with travel time measurements to better understand how waves are affected by Earth structure. So in short, arrays are great. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much.